Well, welcome. I know that you have um, limitless things you could be staring at on your computer right now. So I appreciate you spending some of that time this morning with us. A little bit about me. Um, my name is Robert Ingalls. I, let me get these off my screen here. All right. Um, I am a former attorney. I spent about six years in practice, but it turns out my soul was not built for that kind of work. And so I was a podcast hobbyist and I discovered somewhere along the way of deciding I didn't want to be an attorney anymore right after getting married and that um, there was a, a perhaps a market to be found in podcasting. It was starting to grow. I really enjoyed it. Uh, fast forward uh, a few years and now that's what I do for a living. I produce podcasts for law firms and I do um, a lot of this kind of coaching stuff for students in the area. There's a number of uh, podcast in the Charlotte market that I helped launch with um, with their creators. I believe the the Charlotte Readers podcast is partnered with the Charlotte Mecklenburg Library. That is also uh, a recovering lawyer, except he made it about 35 years, I think, in practice. So he's really, he calls himself uh, recovering, but he's a retired lawyer. Um, but that's Landis Wade. You check out the Charlotte Readers podcast. That is one of my former students just to give you a little background on me, enough about me. Um, so you've probably, you know, you're probably at least familiar with podcasts. Do you listen to podcasts? Nice. Well, it is a fun little hobby and that's how I started as well. I listened to my first podcast in 2015 when I was kind of having a crisis of conscience and trying to figure out what to do with my life. And then a month, literally a month later, I owned like a thousand dollars worth of gear. I am not going to recommend that you take that route. Um, <laughs> but it, thankfully it worked out for me and I didn't end up having to sell all of it on uh, Craigslist. But actually, this microphone in front of you is one of the things I bought because I had to have the best microphone. Um, but I will go over that as we get a little later, too, around the different kinds of things you can use to get started. You can really start a podcast for under 100 bucks. So, all right. So, what we're going to go over today is what you know what a podcast is. So, we're not going to go deep into that. We're going to talk about defining your niche, just discovering the kind of thing that you might want to podcast about. Who is your target audience? What is the format of your show? giving your podcast a name, where should your podcast exist? What is an RSS feed? Branding your show, music, artwork, logo, publishing schedule. That's one people always ask about. How long should your episodes be? Equipment for every budget, software options, podcast terminology. Let's dive in. So what is a podcast? Now you've listened before, so you know what it is, but the dictionary definition is a digital audio file made available on the internet for downloading to a computer or mobile device usually as a series, new installments of which can be received by subscribers through your RSS feed. And you can also use it as a verb to make available as a podcast. Right. The history of podcasting in a skinny minute. In 2004, podcasting was born. People had been creating these digital audio files for download for longer than that. But in 2004, a journalist, while writing about this digital audio file phenomenon, used the word podcasting. And the reason that they use that, that word itself is because generally people were using Apple's iPod to listen to podcasts. They would download them to their iPod. So they, the word he used was podcasting and it stuck. 2004, the first service provider to host podcasts on came. That's where you upload your podcast to in order mm -hmm. to send it out into the world. 2005, it was declared word of the year. And then uh, in 2006, Steve Jobs showed the world how to make one at the Apple keynote using GarageBand, which is a free uh, service that still comes on Apple products. One billion subscribers by 13. 2015 was a big year for podcasting. A, it's the year that I got involved. But it's also the year that President of the United States was interviewed on a comedian's podcast. That put people in a position where they said, uh, well, what's a podcast and how do I listen to it? Because they were interested in hearing what the President of the United States had to say on this podcast that they hadn't heard of before. And what was really cool about that, too, is instead of the, the podcaster coming to the White House, Barack Obama actually went to Mark Marin's garage because that's how he records his podcast in his garage. Everybody comes there. He doesn't go to anybody. So that was, it really showed the power of the medium. 
and um, it, it put it on the map for a lot of people. But also in 2015, Serial was born. And I don't know if you've heard of Serial, but it is arguably one of the most famous podcast series in history. And everyone was listening. It was, it was, def- it, it, it was really culturally everywhere for a moment. Everyone, have you listened to Serial? Did you hear the new episode? And so it forced a lot of people to figure out how to go listen to it because the only way you could listen to it was on a podcast. Like you had to get on your phone and figure out how to get a podcast. So it put a lot of people onto the app. And then once you're on the app, that's when it gets sticky because you, you're in there and you're listening to Serial, but then it says you might also like, kind of like Amazon does. If you bought this, you might also like this. And so people realize that there's an entire world of podcasts in there. There's literally a podcast about everything. There's a podcast from guys who eat ice cream in Vancouver and talk about the ice cream. Like that's, that's how niche podcasting is. Mm -hmm. There's a podcast on anything you can imagine. Like Mm -hmm. any of your hobbies, I can promise you there's a dozen podcasts about it. Some of them probably aren't great, but they're there. Mm -hmm. All right. So the state of the industry, just to show you how it's growing, I like to do a couple slides on this. So, when I got into podcasting in 2015, if you said the word podcast in a room of a hundred people, 49 of them would have any, would, would even have heard the word before they would say, mm. Oh, I, I'm familiar with that word. That doesn't even mean they know what it is. That just means that they're familiar with the word. Right. Now in the last five years, that number has gone up to 75. So mm. that's, that's a big jump. So out of that room of a hundred, it went from 49 to 75 people now are familiar with the word. So what that, that, that's great in a couple of ways. It's great in that it's growing this quickly, but it's also great because there's 25% of the population over the age of 12 that still doesn't know. And so when people say podcasting is getting saturated, I say 25% of people don't even know what the word means yet. Mm. There's a lot of white space left out there. <laughs> podcast listening on the rise it's kind of that same stair step that we see with podcast familiarity is in 2015 33 percent had ever listened ever listened at all one time even and that number is up to 55 percent so again numbers climbing a lot of white space left 45 percent of the population has never listened as of 2020 monthly listening also that beautiful staircase that we like to see or at least me in the industry likes to see because that's what I do for a living. So I need that staircase to keep rising. All right. Another interesting factoid about podcast consumers is they tend to be more educated and they tend to make more money. So as a business, uh, as a service provider of podcasts, this is a slide I always like to discuss with my potential clients. And if you are ever interested in the business side of this, that is something to be aware of the statistics of when you look at the average population, the average household in the United States, podcast listeners by and large are tend to have a higher level of education and they tend to make more money. So when people are thinking about starting a podcast as a business, that, that usually is a, is a nice bit of information that they're like, Oh, that's good. Because when we start a business, we always want clients that have what money. Mm -hmm. So, Employed full time, more educated, make more money. So here is where we start to talk about you a little bit. So you said you were interested a little bit about podcasting and Mm -hmm. you thought maybe it's something you'd like to learn to do. Have you ever thought about like, if I was going to do this, what would I want to do it about? Yeah, I I think that's very timely because that's an issue you see in popular culture a lot is these issues that veterans are facing. And, and there's, you know, we hear about all these resources and then, but then we see so many veterans, even anecdotally in our everyday life, we see people who are um, not taking advantage of this. And I think we'll, we'll ask right. ourselves like, why aren't they? And then probably yeah. a lot of it is access to information is right. where is this stuff? How do I get a hold of this stuff? So I think that's a very timely. And I think, um, you know, I'm obviously not an expert in that field, but from my anecdotal experience, that sounds like something that would be valuable. All right. So we know why you're starting a podcast. That's, that's a question. A lot of people, and I was in this boat when I started is I listened to some podcasts and I went, Oh my God, this really speaks to me. I, you know, I'm a, I don't know if you can tell in the, you know, in the 10 minutes we've been talking, but I am chatty. And so it resonated <laughs> with me right away. Um, mm-hmm. So I can sit here and talk to people and, and, you know, 
for the most part, like, I mean, I kind of control the conversation because the listeners are not really engaging back and forth with me. And so that spoke to me right away. Right. Um, but I didn't know what I wanted to start a podcast about. And so there was a lot of um, kind of moving back and forth and trying to discern what my message was. Um, it sounds like mm-hmm. you kind of have that already nailed down, but um, that, that was something I had a lot. I started a couple of different businesses around a podcast and those didn't really pan out. And eventually I realized, oh, I think I actually want to make these for other people. And that's, that, that's ultimately where I went into. But when people are starting a podcast, frequently they are thinking about venturing into the online marketing space as a marketing tool for an existing business. That's most of my clients are using it as a marketing tool. Some people just want to have fun. And then some people want to quit their job and travel the world. And I'll tell you if you're, you know, I I would say like the angle that you're looking at is you are starting one as an informational podcast. You want to help people out and and give them resources. And being that you are retired and you're looking for kind of a hobby, it's not something where it sounds like you are banking on this to make a ton of money, right? So one of the nice things though is with, with the angle that you're pursuing, I think that there is probably opportunities for sponsorship. So Mm -hmm. you are taking your time and energy and some of your money to put something together that will be very valuable for society at large. Because I think that society as a whole benefits when all of us have access to information and resources and ways to make ourselves better, to pull ourselves up. And those are the kind of things that I think companies and individuals would be excited to be involved in. So Mm -hmm. one of the things I would Mm -hmm. recommend, and and I'm probably getting ahead of myself because there's probably a slide about this. I tend to forget what I'm even talking about. Um, But one of the things I would recommend to you is looking for those strategic partnerships, finding people who would be willing to sponsor the show. And that Mm -hmm. way, it, it, not not even from an, a, a point of you trying to make income, but you covering your expenses because, mm-hmm. you mm-hmm. know, you, you're going to need to buy at least a microphone to get started. And then you, there's going to be, you know, there's tends to be some fees associated with getting the show up and running. They're not high, but if you're going to take a lot of time and energy to do these things and you're putting out a product that is very valuable to our veterans, I think that there's going to be people who would be very happy to be involved in that journey with you. So that's something to consider. Okay. Um, I always recommend people make a mission statement around their show. Um, uh, Generally, if it's going to be a show where they're going to be starting it as a business and they're um, going to be producing it as part of their revenue stream, I think a mission statement is very helpful. Like any business that you start, a mission statement is helpful. Um, and, and that's just kind of getting down on paper, why it is you're doing what you're doing. And that way, when, you know, life gets hard and you are trying to figure out what it is that you're supposed to be doing, that mission statement can frequently be helpful. Oh, that's why I'm doing what I'm doing. I actually have a vision board that you can't see. Um, you can see the bottom of it right there. There's the bottom of it that says create every day, but there's a lot of stuff right above it. That is kind of a a summary of my mission statement as well. There's pictures of places I want to live. There's, there's the car, um, that I'm going to buy. When, okay. um, when I'm ready, you know, when, the, when, the, when the, the big money comes in, um, <laughs> there's, you know, a picture, a picture of the family I'm creating. So that kind of stuff is very helpful for me because mm-hmm. when I'm just like, Oh, I can't take another second of this. I can go, <laughs> okay, here's why I'm doing what I'm doing. A value prop can be very helpful to explains how your product solves your customer's problems or improves their situation, how it delivers specific benefits tells the ideal customer why they should buy from you and not the competition, why your podcast is better to listen to and spend time on than someone else's might be. Uh, Niche, niche, niche. We talked earlier about trying to figure out what that podcast is about. Some people, a big one you hear people say is I want to talk about entrepreneurship. And I say, that's great. If this was 2012, that's fantastic because there's not a lot of shows about entrepreneurship yet, but fast forward eight years, it's not 2012 anymore. And there are thousands of shows about entrepreneurship And so instead of talking about entrepreneurship, maybe you should talk about a a specific niche in entrepreneurship, maybe Mm -hmm. um, women entrepreneurs over 40, you know, something Mm. like that, something that is, you know, because a lot of times I'll say, well, think about what it is that you want to talk about and then go look for podcasts about what you want to talk about. And then Mm -hmm. they realize really quickly, oh, geez, there's so many podcasts that are doing exactly what I want to do and say, that's okay. 
Now figure out where your unique passion and expertise can niche down. What is it that I am uniquely qualified to talk about? It could be women entrepreneurs over 40 years old. Um, it could be even more specific. It could be women entrepreneurs over 40 that live in the Southeast. And, and you know, obviously I'm just making this up, but that's the kind of idea is when you're trying to make a show that stands out, it can be helpful to make a show that isn't already being done. Something that is niche down to a degree that you can then capture attention. Okay. So, but some of this is just high level and you know, you, you kind of already have your niche in mind. Identifying your target audience. Uh, one thing I will tell people to do is create an avatar. That avatar is not a demographic. It is not, um, you know, men that are in a certain area, like, or over a certain age. Your avatar is one person. It is your one perfect ideal listener that you're making that for. And I don't think that would be very hard for you because you said mm -hmm. your husband is a veteran. This is one yeah. of the reasons that this is a close to home issue for you. So that's going to be probably an easier exercise for you to do is figure out who are the people that need the thing that you're giving them. Mm -hmm. And then what is it that they need? And mm -hmm. because one of the problems people run into when they are creating a podcast is they will make a, a 10 episodes and then they'll go, well, what else do I talk about? And we all know that any, I mean, literally any issue on the planet, you can talk about for more than 10 episodes. But after we've been talking for a while, we start to go, well, I don't know what else to talk about. And that is where having an avatar in mind helps or even uh -huh. knowing people in your target market that you can ask questions to because uh -huh. they have uh -huh. so many issues. And, and the, th the thing is like, there are actual veterans issues, but then there are issues that affect veterans that at first blush might not seem related, but it's issues that a lot of them will face. Those are things that can also be talked about. So mm -hmm. being able to come up with that avatar and, and think about who they are, what they need is, is a very helpful way to make decisions for the content of your show and actually generate content for the show and okay. stay on track. Clear message. What is it you want to be known for? What is your value proposition statement? Because while you're making this podcast for veterans, it's still, it's not going to matter if no one hears it, you know? Mm -hmm. And so even though you're saying, well, I'm doing this um, as a retirement project and I'm not really looking to make money from it, we mm -hmm. still have to approach it like it's a business because marketing is going to matter because we have to figure out a way to ensure that the people we need to help are actually going to be receiving it. Because when you think about it, the, one of the reasons you're making it is because the people you're trying to help don't know where to find help. So we have to break through and help them understand that this is the help that's going to help. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. So you have mm -hmm. to kind of look at it like it is a business and think through the business you know, strategies. What is it we want to be known for? What's our value proposition statement? Do we have a memorable brand slogan or a tagline that will help people remember us and talk to each other about us? Learn about your audience, kind of overlap for what I said a moment ago. One really good way, and you probably have access to a lot of veterans because I know that um, mm -hmm. veterans tend to have a pretty decent network with yeah. other veterans that they served with and that they've met along the way through different organizations. But yeah. you can survey those people and interview them and learn about their problems that they're facing and the pains associated with those problems. Right. Think about the format. This is... Um, you know, people say, well, should it be me? Should it be on interviews? Should I have a co-host? And that is just something to think about. There's no, there's no right or wrong answer to this. It's really just what, what kind of show is it that you want to create and what kind of format is going to be the most valuable. If it's going to be two people talking about these issues, if it's going to be somebody coming in and interviewing different veterans about things um, for yours, I, I like the idea of, you know, you could even bring in people that work in these various veteran assistance programs Absolutely. and can take you through stories because stories are always helpful. They make the, they make the brain stick around and want to listen. Okay. And then when you're telling you're, they're telling stories, but they're also getting a lot of information across as well. So think about how often you want to publish daily, weekly series seasons. And is this a schedule you can commit to? Um, you know, depending on the amount of time that you want to put into it, um, week, weekly shows tend to do well, 
but it, it really is like how much time and energy do you want to put in? I would say if you are producing this all by yourself and doing all of the work yourself, I would expect if you are each episode, I think you're probably going to put at least 10 hours into each episode and you have to think, you know, you're going to plan it out. What am I going to talk about? Who am I going to talk to? If you're going to have a guest, you have to email back and forth with them and get it set up. You've got to prepare for the show. You've got to actually record it. Then you, you know, you got to do, you'll probably do at least some light editing on it. And I know that mm-hmm. probably sounds like if you're not that technical savvy, that's probably really scary, but we'll talk about that. It's really not that hard to do really basic editing. Um, and there's free programs that come on your computer that can do them. And then from there, you got to get it set up. You got to get it published and out into the world. So I would expect, you know, depending on, um, you know, the amount of work you want to put into it. Most people are going to spend about 10 hours on, on an episode. So think about that. All right. I put this slide in here because that was one of the things um, what people always say, how long should my episode be? I don't think there's really a right answer to that. I think the right answer is as long as it needs to be. Um, I know that probably sounds trite, but when someone is telling you a story, like we've all listened to good storytellers that we're just like, oh my God, what happens next? And we've listened to the bad ones where we're like, oh my God, I wish they would stop talking. And (laughs) you don't want to be the second one. You always want to be the first one. Mm -hmm. So put just in, you know, you want your episodes to cover the subject. You want them to be long enough that they cover what needs to be talked about, but also to be interesting, but you Mm -hmm. never want them to be so long that they just feel like they're taking up space. When I, you know, there's, I've listened, I listen to a lot of different new shows that I never listen to again because people mm-hmm. say, oh, you should listen to this podcast and I'll flip it on. And sometimes the first five minutes is just the host talking about something that I don't understand. I'm sure that if I'd listened to the first 50 episodes of the show, I'd understand it. But mm-hmm. when someone is jumping into your podcast for the first time, you have to remember every single episode might be a new listener. So you can mm-hmm. banter. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't suggest it be in the first five minutes. You need to establish rapport. So we always need to remember with our audience, like when we're creating an episode, it needs to be informational. It needs to be what someone wants to hear and not filled with just what you want to do because people get bored. And like I said, you know, I said at the beginning of this uh, discussion that there are countless things that your eyeballs could be on right now. And that's how everyone is. Like there's literally a click away from the world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I put commute in there just because um, one of the more famous shows out there called entrepreneur on fire. That's how he built his show. He said in 2011 or 12, when he launched his show, he was trying to figure out what the, he figured out what the average commute was in the United States. And he decided to make his show like 25 minutes so people could listen because his was a daily show. So people could listen every single day on their way to work. And generally they would be able to have the show finished by the time they got to work. Naming your podcast. So one of the things I say is clear is better than clever. People love to be clever with their show titles. The problem people run into with being clever is that when someone hears about it, they don't know what it's about. And it might be incredibly clever if someone explained it to them and they would go, oh, ho, 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 that is funny. But if they need it to be explained to them, it's too late because frequently no one's there to explain it to them when they discover it. So clear is better than clever. If you can do clear and clever together, even better. But generally, you just want to name your show in such a way that someone can understand what the value they're going to get from the show is before they start listening because they may never. Um, while, while I said it's a podcast, not a food truck, because food trucks are always super clever names. Um, <laughs> here's just a bunch that you can look at on your own time when we send you the slides. A bunch of fun food truck names that I found. That I found. Oh, I thought okay. nonsense was fantastic. <laughs> I think that'd be a good name for a podcast as well. Um, cover art. So the cover art is that little piece of artwork in the podcast player that you see, and that is honestly the thing that most people look at. So when they search for a show. This, a lot of times they won't even look at the title. They will look at the cover art because that's where the title is going to be anyway. So the cover art is going to be important to communicate what your show is about. And I, this is one of my favorites, uh, cover arts, smart passive income, because I look at that and I say, okay, that's probably about making money 
in, in, in a, using my head to make money that I'm not actively having to work on, where I'm not trading my dollars for time, passive income, right? And it mm-hmm. probably has a lot to do with business blogging and lifestyle, using that, those types of uh, angles to make smart passive income. And that is exactly what it's about. Um, I saw this one and I saw, I saw the way the font was and mm-hmm. girls, the word girls, not how to talk to women, how to talk to girls. So I assume mm-hmm. that it's probably for men in their teens and 20s who do not have good self-confidence and have never learned how to talk to the opposite sex. And mm-hmm. it is 100% mm-hmm. what that show is about. So that is fantastic mm-hmm. cover art. Mm-hmm. Then I saw this one and I said, well, what is that about? And I said, well, it could be about podcasting. Maybe it's a microphone. It's pretty aggressive though. It's like, maybe it's about fighting. Maybe it's about um, like, you know, those, it looks like one of those microphones that you'd see in like a fighting ring. And, and I said, well, it could be, you know, about that. I, I really, it could be music, you know, a hard rocker. It's not, it's about video games. And that's terrible cover art because when I see it, I have no idea what it's about. Another one that's bad is this one, DLC. That is also a video game podcast. But when I'm scrolling by, unless I already know what DLC is, I have no idea what that is. It's going to be hard to attract new listeners with cover art like that. Mm. Another one of my favorite pieces of cover art I've ever seen, Surviving Separation. Mm. When I see that, I'm assuming that I am, if I'm getting divorced. I'm already divorced. If I'm in a situation where I'm getting divorced, this is probably a podcast that's going to help me get through that separation Mm -hmm. and divorce process. And that's exactly what it's about. I love the imagery. It's a wedding cake. It's split right in half, surviving separation. If you are struggling with your divorce and separation, this is the podcast for you. Perfect. Mm -hmm. So, and same thing with the rest of these. These, uh, these three here, I think, do a good job of conveying what you're likely to get inside. So, when you're making your cover art, it's, some, it's, it's good to keep in mind, what am I trying to convey? Can I convey what my show is about? And I think that for a show like yours, I think that that would be easy to, to convey what you're trying to get across. It should grab the attention and convey what the show's about. Here are some things you don't need to remember today, but you need to remember them if you launch a podcast. And there are a lot of different services that can help you put artwork together or you can even do it yourself. There's a lot of, of DIY stuff online now where you can do it yourself. Um, one that is free you can use is called Canva, like Canvas, but without an S, Canva. And they have a ton of different templates that you can just pop up on the screen and type your own stuff into, drag different pieces of artwork. It's like drag and drop builder, very easy to use. So you can actually make your own cover art there, or you can go to a place like Fiverr, fiverr fiverr.com. And for, you know, five or 10 bucks, you can get someone to make some cover art for you. Okay. But this information, again, don't think, don't worry about remembering this stuff right now. But if you go to do it yourself, we're going to send you these slides when we're done. This information is very important for the cover art. It must be in one of these two formats. It must be a minimum of 1,400 by 1,400 square, has to be square, a maximum of 3,000 by 3,000 square, or Apple Mm -hmm. Podcast will not accept it. And currently, about one in every two plays on a podcast come from Apple Podcast, so it's Mm -hmm. vitally important that it be accepted into Apple Podcast. So, again, don't worry about that stuff right this second, but on these slides when you're going through, you want to remember to definitely make them like that. Okay. All right. Make sure it's not too wordy with too much text. If the word, if there's too many words and those words are too small, you got to remember when you listen to a podcast, it's usually on your phone and it is really tiny in that little square. So you want to make sure it's easy to see when you back out. Like if you hold it, if you're at a computer screen, like minimize it a lot and then look at it and be like, Ooh, I can't read that at all. So you want to make sure it can be read in search results. And is, is it aesthetically pleasing? Does it look good? Your intro and your outro. So if you've ever listened to a podcast, which you have, not many, but you've listened, that intro and outro is that first part of the podcast when you first hit play. Usually there's some music, there's somebody talking, sometimes it's the host talking, sometimes it's a professional voiceover actor talking. But that intro and outro is one of the more important parts of your show because it's going to tell people in the first 15 seconds what the show is and what it's about and whether they should listen, whether it's for them. So you want to use that. I think music is a really nice uh, addition 
to it because when you listen to a podcast, when you think about a television show that you watch, like I remember I used to watch the facts of life as a kid. If I was Mm -hmm. to hear, if somebody turned that show on in the other room right now, I'd be like, Oh my God, that's the facts of life. Mm -hmm. And because I know that music. And, And I think that that's really great for the podcast as well, because when somebody starts listening to your show, especially a show that is giving them something of, of tremendous value for them, that's helping them in their life. Mm -hmm. then the moment that they hear that music, they're going to feel better. Like Mm -hmm. it's going to catch them. They're going to be like, oh, okay. All right, this is my thing. And so having some good music that that you like, but also would resonate with with your listeners as well, um, helps brand the show instead of just like the show starting and you're talking. Right. So you can DIY the voiceover. That's something that you can record yourself. We're going to talk a little later about microphones, but you can sit with your computer and just record your intro and then use a a free little editing service on your computer. And you can put that music there. You can put that intro right there with it. And so when your show starts, it's going to be you talking right over that, you know, maybe 15, 20 seconds. Just, Hey, welcome to this show. This is what we're going to do today. This is, or not even today. You could have one that you use for every single episode. This welcome to the show. This is what the show's about. Yada, 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 whatever you want to say. Um, think about what you're going to say in that script, you know, cause it's 15, 20 seconds long, maybe 30 seconds. You want to keep it relatively short to just tell them here, here's who we are. Here's what we do at this show. You're in the right mm-hmm. place. Um, you can, when, when I send these slides to you, you can check this out. This is an example of a really, really well done intro that tells exactly what the show's about and why somebody would want to listen to that show. Very well done intro right there. These are all linked. So when you get these slides, you can click on these links. All right. This is something you don't need to stress too much about. I just like to gloss over it and make sure it's in the slides. But an RSS feed stands for really simple syndication. And that's the the easiest way of describing it is this is the way that your show gets into Apple Podcasts and gets everywhere. So, you know, do you, what service do you use to listen? Like when you listen to a podcast, how do you listen to it? Okay. So you like listen on websites. What kind of phone do you have? So on your iPhone, and you probably don't even realize this, there is an app on it right this second that is called Podcast. And if you were to just pull down from the top of the screen, I think that's how you search, you could just type in Podcast and this little purple app will show up. And you tap that app and every podcast in the world is inside that app. And the way they get there is that they are, their RSS feed has been submitted to Apple. And so when we launch a show, We go to, we sign up our show with a hosting service. Mm -hmm. That's where our show lives. And then it creates an RSS feed and and that's a URL. Like here's a URL for a show I used to host called the Future Self Podcast. And this is the RSS feed for it. And when I click on that, it brings me to this beautiful little page. It's my RSS feed page with all the shows that I did on it, right? Mm. And so we take this feed here and we submit that feed to Apple Podcasts, to Spotify, to Stitcher, to TuneIn. We submit it to all the places that people will listen. And then once it gets accepted by Apple Podcasts and all the other places, then that's all, we don't ever have to submit again. So then when we create a new episode on our hosting site and we publish it, it automatically shows up in Apple Podcasts because it goes into our RSS feed. And we don't need to learn how this works. The, the hosting service that we use will do this for us. I just oh, wanted okay. to give you a basic understanding of, of what an RSS feed is because you'll see that word and I didn't want you to be confused. Okay. All right. So here we are. We'll start talking a little bit about actually how to record a podcast. And one of the first things I like to talk about when we talk about recording is proper mic placement because this is something that people get wrong all of the time. Frequently, and I think you see this in TV a lot in movies, is you will see people on their microphone and they are just all up in it like this. And (laughs) while, you know, there are disc jockeys and people who frequently record that can do that. They can get right there with the microphone. And, you know, you'll hear these people on NPR that you can tell that they are inside the microphone almost. Mm. But they are seasoned broadcasters that have been practicing 
how to use their mouth, how to use their lips, how to use their vocal cords in such a way that they are not introducing ugly sounds, for lack of a better phrase, into the microphone. And when I say ugly sounds, I mean things like lip smacking and mouth noises and, <laughs> and just wetness. Like we have wetness in our mouth and it can, mm-hmm. we can hear that and it's, it's kind of off-putting. And another thing that we struggle with when we get right into the microphone like this is we have plosives. We pop our P's and there are certain letters and and P is one of the more, um, the stronger ones that when we say them, they they pop air into the microphone. So we Mm -hmm. don't want air hitting the microphone and like popping our P's. Because Mm -hmm. it makes a really, you can hear it on your side, is it makes an ugly sound. That air hitting the microphone kind of makes an ugly sound. And then it's going to be in your recording and it can be hard to take it out. And so here is the, a good rule is to make a fist, put that fist to the microphone, turn the microphone at about a 45 degree angle from your face, make a fist and go like that. And there you are right there. So instead of going straight in real close, 45 degree angle like that fist Mm -hmm. and then talk right past it. So if I'm talking right past it, you're going to be able to hear everything I'm saying. It's going to keep a lot. I'm far far enough away that it's going to keep a lot of my mouth noises from getting too, uh, too close to the microphone and inside of it where you can hear too much of that. And it's going to keep all those bursts of air from hitting like burst is going to be way worse. if I'm talking right at it. Mm -hmm. So that really is the best mic technique. Boom. Now you can practice and get better because there are people who are really good at talking right into it and they talk without all of this air coming out of their mouth. But for the rest of us in the world, uh, I think that this is a really good rule. So just remember that fist to the side of your mouth, talk past it. Boom. So when you're buying a microphone, it starts to get confusing. Oh, I remember doing this myself because like when I got into podcasting in 2015, I had no background. I was a criminal justice major with political science in college. And then Mm -hmm. I went to law school to be a criminal defense attorney. Mm -hmm. And so when I got into podcasting, I had zero background in business, marketing, communications, any of it, like technical stuff, none of it. So I had to learn all of this myself. And I'm like, what's a dynamic and what's a condenser? That's the first question. And because you see these microphones when you go to buy and you can't figure out what the difference is. The difference you need to know as a um, amateur podcaster is dynamic. That's what you want. You want a dynamic microphone. And the main reason you want a dynamic microphone is because a dynamic microphone is good for broadcasting at home or in places that are not sound studios. Because sound, if you've ever been in a empty room with, uh, with a hard floor and you talk, you hear it bouncing off the walls and you hear that echo. And that's very bad for mm-hmm. microphones because it's not the most pleasant thing to hear in everyday life. But with a microphone, I'm talking into the microphone and my voice comes in initially But then when I'm getting all this bouncing off the walls, now it's coming in over and over and over again. And it just doesn't sound great. It makes, it sounds like just open air and tinny. And it's not a very nice, like right now when you hear me, it's a pretty warm, close sound. Now over Skype or over Zoom, it's not going to be as good as it should be, but it's still going to be a lot better than if I was on like a pair of like Apple earbuds or something like that, or just talking into my computer's microphone. And, but what you want is a dynamic microphone because it's going to cut a lot of the background noise out. Condensers, mm-hmm. while, you know, like Christina Aguilera most certainly uses a condenser microphone in the studio because mm-hmm. it's going to get every bit of what's coming out of her mouth. And that's what we mm-hmm. want because she has mm-hmm. a beautiful instrument, but she's also in a sound studio. So when you're mm-hmm. looking for a microphone, you want a dynamic microphone. And okay. I'm going to show you which one you should probably look at. One of my favorites in here in just a minute. And then what you're also going to see is pickup patterns. You're going to see dynamic cardioid is the most frequent microphone you're going to see. And all that means is it picks up sound around the front. That's the pickup pattern. So my microphone is a dynamic cardioid. That means it picks up sound here. So if I turn it back here, you can't hear me as well. Even though I'm talking directly into the side of it, you can't hear me as well as when I talk to the front because the pickup pattern's out here, not over here. 
Mm-hmm. So that's really all that means. So really what mm-hmm. you want is you want dynamic cardio. When you see people, like when you see newscasters and things like that with uh, sometimes they'll have a shotgun mic on top of the camera. And that is, you know, that just kind of shoots right at the person's face. And, and that's how that pickup pattern works. Here's the microphone I'm using right now. Uh, some people will call it the gold standard in the podcasting world. It is a famous microphone. It is expensive. You do not need it. So don't feel like you need a microphone that is this expensive in order to sound good. You do not. I will also ask that you not buy this microphone if at all possible. Um, I, I, I make, uh, I wish it was a joke, but Every class I've ever taught, I've always said, um, like I used to teach a bunch of in-person classes, I always tell people, don't buy this microphone. Please don't buy this microphone. Inevitably, over the course, I used to teach four-week classes. Inevitably, over the course of that four-week class, someone would purchase this microphone. They just couldn't help themselves because, well, a lot of famous people on YouTube and podcasts have this microphone because a lot of people don't really necessarily understand sound quality and they just buy a microphone because I mean they're they're putting out a product and they're less concerned about sound but for the price the thing is this microphone is big and sexy it really is like you can't tell Mm -hmm. how big it is but when it's on your desk like you feel like a broadcaster like you feel like Walter Cronkite with that thing in front of you it's amazing (laughs) it really is a beautiful microphone and if you had a sound studio I think this is a great microphone but Mm -hmm. I don't have a sound studio most people don't have a sound studio Mm -hmm. so don't buy this microphone. It's a condenser. It's, it's going to, your room is going to sound really echoey at home with this microphone. So instead, I don't think I have the new one in here. So this is the microphone I always recommend buy. This actually isn't the right picture. This is the microphone here that I, Mm -hmm. this is just like the one on the screen has been discontinued. This is the same microphone, just the newer Mm -hmm. version. It's $99. Mm -hmm. And what's great about this microphone is you can plug a USB into it. So you can plug your, I don't have my cords over there, but you can plug your USB cord in here and then plug it directly into your computer and now you can use it. So right now, if you had this microphone right now, you could plug it into your computer, you could go to your Zoom settings and change your microphone from your computer microphone to this. And then we would be hearing you through this. It's literally that easy. You plug it in and you click one button, change the sound source for the microphone to this from the computer to this. That's it. Hmm. It's that easy. So that's the microphone I recommend buying. I think I'm going to, in the materials, it's going to be linked somewhere. So, um, and another good thing is too, like if you decide that you want to like build upon it, you can also use this with a mixer. It has a uh, XLR port as well. You don't need to worry about what that is. It's just, if you decided to build upon this, this is one of those microphones that you can incrementally build with. It can go from being a USB microphone to a better microphone for other gear. So I started with a couple of these as well as this one. I use this one for myself and I bought a couple of those for guests. This is another microphone um, that I always like to put options in here. This is one of the ones if you've ever, um, you see these at churches a lot, you see these at concerts a lot. Um, on stage because they are virtually indestructible. You can drive a nail with this thing and it'll work fine. And I actually have a video here you can watch on your own time of people driving over it with a car and then recording with it, microwaving and then recording with it. Like it's incredible. This thing's indestructible, (laughs) but it is not a USB mic. So you would only be able to use this with like a digital audio recorder or a mixer or something like that. Okay. And then if you really were like, I, you know, I don't have, I don't want to spend $99 right this second. You can start a podcast with something as basic as this. Mm. Really, all I really recommend to get started is some kind of localized microphone, some kind of microphone that is meant to just pick up audio from in front of your face. Because some people will try to start a podcast with their Apple earbuds or with just the microphone on their computer or, or not the mic. Yeah. With the microphone on their computer. And those are not great microphones. They're going to sound really far away. They're going to sound like tinny and echoey. And if, I mean, you know, at a minimum, you know, spend that $23, get a microphone mm-hmm. that goes in front of your face, get something, mm-hmm. get some, um, another thing to always have when you're recording a podcast is headphones. Because if I had, you know, the sound coming out of my microphone or out of my computer right now, it would then, it has the possibility of coming back and going back in my microphone and creating an echo. 
And so when you're recording a podcast, you don't want that echo to happen. Mm -hmm. Now, things like Zoom, they have a lot of echo um, cancellation features. But when you're recording a podcast, it can still become a problem. So one of the best ways to get rid of that echo is just put some headphones on. Okay. And then if you ever have a guest, I try to recommend they do that too. Okay. Then here's a here's a nicer set, if, but this is um, this is just XLR. It's your headphones and your microphone all in one place. I have a couple of these that I do for portable recording, uh, but mm. these are these don't have USB, so you would have to again have a mixer or this is kind of the upgraded one as you go on. But I just like to put a lot of different ones in here just in case people want different things. Okay. All right, test recordings. So I made some of these recordings to give you an idea because people say, well, what's the difference between these two microphones? And I will let you listen. So here's the microphone. I did a test recording with the microphone that I'm talking on right now. This is the Heil PR40. It's an XLR microphone, and it really is the gold standard of microphones for podcasters. It's a little in the pricey range coming in around... Now, if you're going to be doing a lot of video and your microphone is going to be in the so shot, that's that this one, that's the $327. This is the Audio-Technica ATR2100. This is one of the most now, that really doesn't micro- sound that different, does it? No. So that is why I say buy the ATR because it is virtually indistinguishable to most ears from the PR40 and it is 125 or $225 less expensive. So I like mm-hmm. that one. Now here is one I made with the Apple earbuds. This is a test recording with the Apple earbuds recording into Adobe. Audio. So not terrible but Mm -hmm. markedly not as good, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So while you can make those work, um, because at least at a minimum, like I said, at least there is a microphone up by your face. So that helps. But for, you know, for that hundred dollars, I think it's very worth it to get, uh, you know, to get a USB microphone. All right. Some quick and dirty stuff on uh, files. Um, I don't want to confuse you and get too much in the weeds right now. There's really only two kinds of files you need to worry about. You need there, So dot .wav files when you're recording are just big uncompressed files. And then you've probably heard of MP3s. MP3s mm-hmm. are just, they're taking that file and they're compressing it. They're making it smaller so mm-hmm. it's not so big and unwieldy. It doesn't take up a ton of space. Mm-hmm. When we upload to podcast players, we always want to upload an MP3. Okay. Um, a lot of times it's good to record in dot wave. And then when we're done editing the file, then we export it in MP3. And I don't want to get too technical right this second, but I like to put these things in here. So when you're on your own time, kind of looking through things and figuring things out, this will help solve some of those problems for you. Okay. So like I said, the wave is just uncompressed. It's the highest quality sound possible. It's large files. And then the MP3 is compressed audio lower quality but much smaller files now we say lower quality it's fine for podcasting voice like it's it's totally fine and the one of the distinctions i want to make and make sure you understand is when you're recording it's good to record into the dot wave format and then compress it all down like after you edit it and you're ready to export it into a full, a finished file, it's good to export it from wave into MP3 because if you record in MP3, you're recording into a compressed format. And so I was born in 1980. Um, I don't, I don't, I mean, I'm guessing if you're retired, you were born a few years before that, but you would remember tapes, right? So I don't know yeah. if you ever made mixtapes. You could sit down, you know, and make your mixtape, record it off of a record or record it off the radio. And then sometimes your friend would have a really good mixtape. And if you had one of those, you know, rich friends, they'd have that double tape deck where you could record from one tape to the next. Mm -hmm. And you would put their mixtape in and you record it to your mixtape. But the problem was your mixtape sounded worse than theirs because you were recording from a tape onto another tape. So it was deteriorating the quality. Mm-hmm. And and I tell you that story because that's what happens with an MP3. If you record into MP3 format, that's a compressed file. You have now compressed that audio. So if you then export from an MP3, if you edit an MP3 and then export to MP3 again, 
you're making a mixtape of the mixtape, if that makes sense. Okay. And so you're going to deteriorate the quality further if you, com- if you recompress a compressed file. Okay. So that, that's enough getting in the weeds on that. Oh, right. Um, you're not going to, I'm not going to recommend you use a digital audio recorder. Um, right now, I, I mean, th- this is a kind of a step up if you're you know, starting to get a podcast together and getting out in the field and doing interviews and stuff, you can buy a little digital audio recorder you can plug microphones into. Those are good settings if you have a digital audio recorder, but we'll skip over that for now. Mm-hmm. We talked earlier about exporting that finalized version. After you edit your podcast, you export it. These are good rules for exporting um, your MP3s. It, usually 112 KBS, and that's a setting. Don't stress too much about it now. It's just when you go to do it, you'll be like, it's going to ask you, what setting would you like to export your MP3 in? And then you can come back to this document here, and you'll be like, 112, that's the setting I'd like to export in. Mm-hmm. So that's, it's just, it's small enough that it doesn't take up a lot of space, but it's big enough that it's not going to sound bad. Okay. So here are some software options. Cloud storage is the, one of the number one things you're going to want. I don't know if you have cloud storage now, but I recommend it. You, um, you know, think about like when people, you'll see people that will, you'll see them and you'll be like, oh, uh, give me your number. I lost my phone and I lost all my numbers. And you're like, how did, that, what, what year is that? How did you lose all your numbers? How are they not backed up somewhere? And I, I was in, I was in um, law school with a girl and she came in, she was crying. Someone had broken into her house and they'd stolen her computer and she lost like a bunch of work for law school. And I just looked at her like dumbfounded. Like how, how did you lose your work? It wasn't backed up anywhere. And I mean, that was just such a foreign concept to me because mm-hmm. I've had Dropbox since it was in beta, like in the early 2000s. And, and if you're not using cloud storage, essentially what that does is it just makes like, you know, you have a folder on your computer mm-hmm. and anything you put in that folder is also backed up to the cloud. So if mm-hmm. somebody mm-hmm. kicks in your door and steals your computer, mm-hmm. you go to the store, you buy a new computer, you download Dropbox and mm-hmm. everything is right back on your computer like it was before. Gotcha. So I always, and, and the thing is, I think Dropbox has like two gigabytes for free. Google Drive, I think with a Google email address, you get like 15 gigs for free. So there's lots of free cloud storage out there. And what I always recommend backing up all of your podcasting stuff into cloud storage. Let's say that you do an interview with somebody, you do this hour long interview. It's a really good interview. It's only on your hard drive and you spill your coffee on your hard drive. That could be gone forever. Mm-hmm. Now that interview doesn't exist anymore. And mm-hmm. anything else that was on your computer doesn't exist anymore. So that's one thing. Like after I record a podcast interview, the very first thing I do is I put it into my cloud storage Dropbox folder. And because okay. it, it immediately is backed up and I can never lose it again. It's there forever. Mm-hmm. So even mm-hmm. if I lose my computer or break it or anything, it's always going to be there. So get some kind of cloud storage. All right. Recording editing software. What kind of computer do you use? Is it a Windows computer or a Mac Perfect. So there is a software called Audacity. Now there's a lot of other ones out there that you can check. You can just type in to Google. You can say free podcast editing windows and it'll give you a bunch of different options. Audacity is one of the more famous options. It's a free software that you can download to a Windows computer and you can edit your podcast with it. There are lots of different tutorials that you can find on YouTube that will show you how to use it. It's relatively user friendly. I have a lot of people who are retired that I have taught the podcast that use Audacity. So it's not something that is um, only for like tech people. It's something you can certainly learn how to use. Now, I don't use it myself. I have, um, there's some tutorials that I have made myself for students in other classes that I have taught. This is for Adobe Audition. Um, That's a paid service. I think it's about 20 a month or 25 a month. Not something Mm -hmm. you need when you're starting out. It's what I use. Mm -hmm. Um, And then this is one for GarageBand, but that's only on Mac. But like I said, if you wanted to use Audacity, there's you just go into YouTube and type, uh, you know, how to edit podcast Audacity. There's going to be hundreds of videos, plenty of good ones out there. Okay. All right. Remote recording software. Zoom is one of the more popular options. You can just set up a Zoom call. Like right now, I could be recording this call as a podcast. You and I mm-hmm. talking right here. I could be recording it and I could use that as a podcast. Sound quality is not the best in the world. 
mm-hmm. but it's, it's good enough. Like, I mean, it, you know, I think the zoom's free plan goes up to 40 minutes. So if you were doing a podcast yeah. under 40 minutes, you can do it for free zoom calls. I think, I don't think there's a time limit on a zoom call or on a Skype call. So you could be using Skype and on their free version and just record your entire podcast there. And, mm-hmm. and that's free. Now there are some other services that the sound quality is going to be a lot better, but they're, you know, around 20 a month, I think. Um, depending on how much you use them. Squadcast is one. Another one's called Riverside, riverside riverside.fm. That's the one I actually use. I use Squadcast as well, but I use Riverside more because it has video. I can record a video podcast with people. Another one's called Zencaster. There's other options you can check out, but I think Skype, Zoom, the free options are Mm -hmm. um, the way to go when you start out. And then, like I said, Squadcast and Riverside are better um, for later on. Okay. Uploading your episodes to a hosting service. I've said the word hosting service a lot and you probably weren't necessarily sure what I was talking about. That is where your podcast lives. That's its home. So I'll show you really quickly like what my hosting service looks like. So I produce a bunch of shows. And then here's a bunch of shows that I produce for all my clients. And you, you know, if you have one show, you'd have one show here. It'd be your show. And you'd click into it. And then here'd be all of your information about that show. Here's, you know, your latest episodes, when they were published, how many downloads they got. Um, But when you are setting the show up, it's going to take you into all this. It's going to say, what's the name of your podcast? What's the subtitle of your podcast? What is the author of your podcast name? What is the email of the author? Um, Do you have a default publishing time that you'd like to? We always do 3 a.m. Eastern because that turns... Um, into midnight on the West Coast. So it'll always, in the United States, it would always be on the same date. So then you can put the description of your podcast here, your show summary description. You can put it like, here's what my show's about. Here's all the information for that. In here, you can pick categories. You can, you know, go and answer all these little questions. It asks you all the questions that you need to answer. What's your website, things like that. And then it creates your RSS feed. Remember we talked about the RSS feed? It creates that right here. Then you get that and then you just submit that to Apple. So that Mm -hmm. is your hosting service. And then when you want to create new episodes, you just come to the episode tab. You click publish episode. You drop your MP3 right there. And it would be uploading. You put your title, your subtitle if you had one. You put your show notes, the description of your show, any links that you might want to put. Like let's say that you interviewed somebody from, uh, I'm just going to make something up, the Veterans Commission for Health, whatever. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. you would link that there because they would say, well, go to this website to get access to the benefits or whatever, whatever it is you Mm -hmm. want them to find. And you can put all the links in there, right there in the show notes. So in the podcast, they would say, this is the website. And you would say, and we're going to link that in in the show notes for you. And that way they know in their podcast player, they can just go to the show notes, click the link, and it's going to take them right where they want to go. You can mm. put the episode number here, all of that information mm. right there. And so it's really easy. This is a hosting service. And it's just where your show lives. So every time you publish that episode, it's going to then go to Apple Podcast, to Stitcher, all those different places. So there's a lot of them. If you just type into Google podcast hosting service, actually, let's go down to that. Okay. Here is a bunch of them right here. That was a very timely question. So here are the ones that, um, the more famous ones. There is Podbean, Libsyn, Buzzsprout, Blueberry. The one I just showed you is called Captivate. Now, I'll tell you when you're just starting out and if you're on a budget, there's one called Anchor and it's owned by Spotify and it's free. And you can start your podcast. You can, it's a hosting service. You can upload everything to it. You can connect it to Apple and you can start it for free. Now, one of the things to keep in mind is when something is free, you're the product, right? Mm-hmm. And, and so just that, that's something to keep in mind is you won't necessarily own the show. They, um, they're not going to, you know, they won't advertise on it unless you allow them to. I think they'll give you a small amount of money if you allow them to advertise on your show. That's something that you can think about as you choose if you want to. But if the show started to gain some traction, I would consider moving it away from Anchor. Just, okay. um, I don't really like the, the, the free products because like I said, you know, when, when something is free, there's always a reason. It's because they're using right. you to make money. Gotcha. So, but if you're just starting out and you just really want to keep price down, Anchor is not a bad option. Mm-hmm. Uh, eventually, I think it's a good idea to have a website. 
but um, you know, being that this is kind of uh, this is more of a project for you, not really a business opportunity, mm -hmm. then because a the website's going to take a lot of time, a lot of energy, and you're going to put some money into it. Mm -hmm. So you might not necessarily want to do it right away, but eventually okay. it can be very good to have a website for your podcast, somewhere where people can go. Because you just said you listen on your laptop, right? And yeah. other people do as well. So without right. a website, um, it can be a little harder for people to find the podcast. Okay. Um, like, let's see, I was going to show you, I was going to show you an example of what it looks like on a podcast, a podcast website. So here is one of my clients websites for their podcast. So here's the podcast page, the, the main podcast page. It has all of the episodes on one player, but then below it, it has all the subscribe links where they can go and subscribe. And then it also has each episode in its own post. So you click into the episode you can play the episode right Hello there. there. Going through a divorce. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. can also read all the show notes, any links that they had, like here's the link to the person's website that was there. The transcript is there. So you can have, you know, your website allows you to put all this information there. Okay. All right. So, and there's just, you know, some website information. If you are considering a website at some point, you can come back and reference this stuff. I won't take up a lot of that time now. Um, here's more information about posting on your website. Episode name generator, must-haves for your website. Um, yeah, I won't. I won't dig too much into that. This is, but this is good information if you are deciding to do that later. Okay. Sh writing meaningful show notes. So the show notes are really just a description of the show for listeners to see in the podcast player, and. It should give a listeners a glimpse of what the episode's about. Just, you know, here's who we had on. Here's what we talked about. Just some interesting stuff. A, for people to be able to read and see what it's about. But when you write those show notes, it also allows the podcast player, when somebody searches, like if they search for veterans information in a podcast player, your show notes, as well as your show description and the titles of your episodes are going to be searched by iTunes or Apple and if some of that, inf the more information that you have written in the description, the name of the show, the episode titles, and the actual show notes themselves, all that's going to be used to deliver results. So when you mm -hmm. write what the show's about, if somebody searches that show's about, those show notes are going to help return that in a result when somebody searches. Okay. So writing show notes is a pretty good idea. You can link information like we talked about, any resources that you mentioned, how to connect with the guest calls to action for them. Right. You can add timestamps to key moments in the episode, quotes from the episode, links to transcriptions, links to similar episodes. If you like this episode, you might also like this other episode, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Actually, this is the, this is one of, uh, that's my client's page right there. This is what some mm -hmm. show notes look like. Mm -hmm. uh, here's what they look like in a podcast player. I think this is an Apple right here. Mm -hmm. I think I can't remember. Getting the most out of podcast content. So something you can also do, getting down really into the weeds, is repurpose your po podcast content. You can post the episodes on your website with the audio and show notes, but you can also transcribe them, put that on your website. Tell everyone, you can email your list, make your podcast noticeable and easy, easily accessible from your homepage on your website so people can get to it. You can also repurpose your content. So you have your individual podcast episode that you recorded, right? And you can share that on social media. You can send it in emails, but you can also create short form pieces of content. And if you spend any time on social media, I am sure that you have seen these. They're memes, images, quote images, audiograms, stories, different pieces of micro content. So, you know, if you have, you know, about a, let's say you have like a 30 second clip of a really impactful quote is you could take that and cut it up and you could put that into an audiogram that you could share on social media that people could then see and listen to and go, oh, well, that was really good. I would like to listen to the entire piece of content that that came from. Those are very popular. Okay. And you can distribute those across all social media platforms. I'm, I'm about, I'm, it sounds like I'm giving you a full-time job, doesn't it? <laughs> like I've tried to retire. All right, so here's what some of these look like. Um, here's a quote image from a podcast. Put a little quote in there. Here is um, 
that that's a example of an audiogram. You've got your little sound bar mm-hmm. across the bottom, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. sound bar across the top. So when they clicked on it, it would play it. And I don't mm-hmm. think those actually came through on here, but that's what they look like. Okay. All right. Here's another one, little sound bar there. Episode 15. Here's a different one for YouTube. Has their thing here. Just all different kinds of ways to do to share these things. Then you can think about a launch strategy. That is your plan to launch your show with a bang. That way, like we said, if you have this very valuable show for veterans, but no veterans know about it, you Mm -hmm. know, it's kind of like the tree falling in the woods. Mm -hmm. No one was there to hear it. Um, So you want to tell everyone, make sure the word gets out there. Make sure people know that it exists. Post it on social media, create a page or a group for people. A group is even better for something like yours is to you know join groups that have to do with veterans and tell them, hey, I have this podcast that exists. And you know I think that if this is valuable for people you know, please share it with them. And so join those groups. You can also make your own group for the podcast where people can come together and share resources and, and discuss the problems that they're having and figure out ways to help and things like that. So social media can help a lot. Um, ask friends and family to help you create buzz, line up guests and encourage them to share it. So if you get a guest on the podcast, not only are you sharing it, but once it publishes, send them an email with the links for them to share it. Say, I I would love it if you could share this because you're doing this as an effort to help. And obviously if the person came on your podcast, they're interested in helping. So they're Mm going to want to help even further and get that show far and wide. So the more people hear it, the more people can be impacted by it. Here we are. We're going to get to the gear. We talked a little about gear earlier. A good rig doesn't have to cost a fortune. This is a sound studio. This is not what we need in our house. Although I do have most of this gear at this point. It's ridiculous. Um, wow. Yeah, it's, it's so sad. Um, I love it though. You don't have to buy it all right away. You don't have to buy anything if you are not ready. So this sh- shot on the left was my very first podcasting studio. It was my spare bedroom in my old house. Very tiny, mm-hmm. not a lot of room there. But that was all my gear to get started. Tiny little mixer, a little dog, digital, digital audio recorder, my iPad, my microphone that I'm still mm-hmm. using. And then this was my, uh, my office, my law office back in the day that I did all my podcasting in. Wow. Yeah. So, and this was my, this was my second desk. I kind of got it all <laughs> into one place. Uh, and my production assistants. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Um, this actually on the left, I just found that picture. I thought it was cool. People podcasting on the road from, uh, from their camper. And then this is actually, uh, I went on vacation to the beach and I brought this with me to podcast there. So Mm. it's uh, very easy. I mean, honestly, if you get the rig I was talking about with just the microphone, your computer, you can take your computer and your microphone anywhere and record. Mm -hmm. Boom, boom, boom. That's some of, that's a bunch of the gear I own, not stuff that everybody needs. What do you really need? You need a microphone some earphones and a computer. That's it. Like that's all you really need to get a podcast started. You can see that microphone. That's the old ATR. This is the new one, this black one here. And all you need is that you get the little USB cord that plugs right into the side of the computer and you are good to go. That is all you need. And that's garage band on there, but you could mm-hmm. use, um, like I said, you know, you have, a you have a windows computer, you can use audacity. Mm-hmm. And so you okay. would open audacity and mm-hmm. it's going to have a little record button somewhere up here. Maybe it's going to have a record button. It's going to be a red round button. They're always red and round. And you are plugged in. You got, you got it selected as your microphone, this ATR. You hit record. That little waveform is going to start right there. And you mm-hmm. are podcasting. Like it's recording mm-hmm. your voice. Okay. So that it's that easy to start a podcast. So a USB mm-hmm. microphone, a computer or a tablet and free editing software. This is the, the, the big slide. That's all you need to get started. Wow. So here are some links that we discussed today. When I said making audiograms, it sounds, it's like, oh my God, how would I ever do that? I'm not a designer. So there's this, um, it's called headliner.app. And it's a really simple, and I think it's free to make 10 per month, which is probably way more than most people need. Here's the website, headliner.app. And it's, it's really easy to make little audiograms, to make okay. little... Um, like something like this. Hmm. Yeah. Cancel. I'll just hit play. Social media is huge, but how do you get people interested in your show once you're on social media? The solution to this problem is actually. So it's, I mean, it's, so you bring in, 
you can put your text on there. You can do the um, captions on there. If you wanted to, you can make captions. You've got your audio, the waveform there. And I mean, you can make one of these in like 20 minutes. It's wow. really easy. So it's not all that complicated. There's so much cool technology that makes things easy to do. All right. Riverside.fm. That's the one I told you that makes videos. You can podcast with videos. Here is a, um, here's the research early on when I showed you those beautiful little stair steppers. Here's the research link that that came from. It's just a bunch of different gear stuff that I use. And I think that's all of it. Yeah. 